So first, uh, I have the great privilege of welcoming all of you. My voice is so loud, I'm going to stand over here. I have the great privilege of welcoming all of you uh, this morning to this great forum. We are so grateful that all of you have come to participate in what we think is going to be an extraordinarily important event and a great kickoff uh, for something tremendous that we hope to accomplish. Now, for those of you who've traveled or gotten up early this morning, I know this is a particularly difficult time. You've been looking at the newspapers. Um, it's very sad to um, share with you. I know the Red Sox lost last night. And uh, I know how sad all of you are about that, but um, there's a rescue plan uh, uh, in place, uh, and uh, I think we'll see better things at Fenway Park soon. Um, I was walking back over from a search committee uh, this morning, and I was thinking a little bit about medical schools, and for some reason I was trying to remember uh, what I was going to say this morning, and I, I couldn't. Um, and I was thinking about my friend, uh, Fred Rogers. So, um, probably known to most of you as Mr. Rogers, uh, Fred was an unbelievable individual. I had the great privilege of knowing him when I went to medical school in Pittsburgh. And uh, he would come in, and he actually gave grand rounds, but would be in the hospital was a phenomenal individual. And um, when I was thinking about this this morning, you know, Fred's insights and wisdom were reflected in his comments, which he would always make. And the thing that he really taught me as I was getting interested in pediatrics as a student, which was that we are responsible for the world in which our children live. And that's an easy thing to say, but a hard thing to live every day. And so many of you here, I know, contribute to that philosophy and live that philosophy, and we are very grateful. Fred, I think, saw that more than anyone far ahead of the curve. And uh, if any of you don't know about Fred Rogers and only know him as Mr. Rogers, I encourage you to Google and read a little bit about his life and see what an amazing individual he was. I think he would be extraordinarily proud of the kind of events that were putting together like this. Well, as you know better than I do, during the past 25 years, the prevalence of pediatric obesity has tripled. There are uh, minority populations in this country where the majority of adolescents are overweight or obese. Um, and it's very clear uh, that uh, in some aspects, life expectancy for the first time ever in this nation may go down because of obesity and type 2 diabetes. This is a prediction which I think, sadly, if we don't do something about child obesity, will come to pass. There's a profound cultural dissonance or disconnect in this country between our willingness to treat disease and our reluctance, I think, to prevent with public health measures. And I think childhood obesity really is a great example of that. It's within our grasp, I think, to do something about this. For obesity, these measures, obviously, you know better than I, would include food marketing, increased physical activities at school and elsewhere, improving the quality of nutrition, and really promoting much greater funding for obesity prevention as well as research programs. We can do that, and you're here today, I hope, to see that the place where this can happen is Vanderbilt Pediatrics and Monroe Carroll Jr. Children's Hospital. Now, you're not really in the Monroe Carroll Jr. Children's Hospital at this exact moment, but Harry Jacobson, who you're going to hear from a little bit later today, the Vice Chancellor, assures me that really the entire Vanderbilt Medical School is really just pediatrics. And uh, you can talk with him in detail about that later, and uh, unfortunately I'm on tape now, so I, I've only been here 141 days. I may not last 142. But one of the real things that is true about that is that one of the great visions of this school, which you'll hear more about, are these goals for 2020, the Vision 2020, which is a phenomenal thing, which is to take what we know and have an impact in our community. And everyone at this school realizes that child wellness is the center of that. And for us, pediatric obesity is the major focus where we want to begin with that child wellness. We know that with your help and with what we're going to learn today, 
We can not only think about obesity, we can not only explore obesity, but we can go out in the community, go out in populations, and make an impact. And that's really the message for today and what we really hope to educate each other about as we go forward. Community, government, national level, local level. The call to do something about this is important. I think you'll see this can happen no place better than the Monroe Carroll Jr. Children's Hospital at Vanderbilt and the Department of Pediatrics with all of your help. Now, I'm going to briefly introduce the morning session. Our first speaker, Roger Cohn, is a recent arrival at Vanderbilt. We are thrilled to have recruited Roger here. He is the chair of the Department of uh, 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 Physiology at Vanderbilt. This is the most distinguished scientific program at Vanderbilt. Uh, one of our uh, uh, several Nobel laureates, Earl Sutherland, uh, was in that department, as have been many other extraordinary individuals. Roger follows right in that tradition. Um, he won't tell you this because he's too humble, but he actually is the discoverer of the system in the brain, which is the major coordinator for homeostasis of metabolism. So what that means in, in, re in terms of thinking about it in practical terms when you eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you have to know how much you should eat. And there are areas in your brain that tell you how to do that, when to stop. These are very important things for us to understand, and Roger has discovered these. He's a phenomenal scientist, but think about it. He's here today because he has a passionate interest in childhood obesity, and he has a passionate interest in what we want to do in the community. And that's what makes Vanderbilt great. We are able to take together all of the components and bring them together to have a phenomenal impact, discovery and compassion. The other speaker this morning I want to briefly mention is Sherry Barkin. Sherry has done an outstanding job to bring this together. Those of you who know her know she is a bundle of energy and enthusiasm and intellect, a little wild around the edges, which is exactly what we love at Vanderbilt and exactly what we want in our faculty. She is a recently endowed chaired professor in the Department of Pediatrics, and she has done a tremendous job of coordinating all our efforts. She is interested in population-based research, translating what we know out into the community, and I think you'll hear from her some incredible ideas and focus about obesity. So it's a great privilege for me to be able to introduce this this morning, to welcome all of you, to tell you once again how grateful we are that you're here. You're going to have a tour of our glorious Children's Hospital a little bit later. And I think at noontime or at lunchtime, Kevin Churchwell, our unbelievable CEO, uh, is going to talk to you a little bit about what's going on at the hospital and about his passion for obesity. It is because of Kevin's resources and commitment that we are all here today, and we are very grateful. And you'll get to know Kevin a little bit better, better later in the day when he makes his remarks and see how tremendous he is. We have all the people here, we have all the resources, we have all the capability. Now today is the kickoff to really make this happen, to do something for our children's future that will really make a difference. So I thank you, I welcome you, and um, why don't we uh, introduce uh, Dr. Cohn. So Roger, please. Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Gitlin for that invitation and also welcome everyone here this morning. What I would like to do is to set the stage by telling you about some of the basic science underlying obesity. And I think the message will be clear uh, as to why prevention is key. Well, I haven't used this projector before. Let's see here, advanced slide, and it's, there we go. So as uh, Dr. Gitlin mentioned, the obesity epidemic ex extends into uh, the pediatric population, and he referred to this um, tripling of obesity incidence in children and, and perhaps even quadrupling in some age groups. And why is this such a problem? Well, first of all, we know that something like 80% of children who are overweight at age 10 to 15 are obese at age 25. And obesity uh, brings with it 
a greater incidence of a large number of medical complications. Everybody knows about the increased incidence of diabetes and obesity, but every day we're learning about increased incidence of other diseases, including certain types of cancers, as a consequence or associated with obesity. Furthermore, there's, there, there are psychosocial implications to obesity that are well studied as well and well known. And just to give you an example of the kind of risk, it's not, in many cases, the additional disease risk associated with ob obesity is not small. Take, for example, diabetes. Um, the hazard ratio, the increased relative risk of getting diabetes if you are overweight can be as high as three to fourfold. If you're obese, BMI greater than 30, uh, can be 10 to 15-fold higher risk of getting diabetes. So the disease risk that is associated with obesity is very, very significant. And these diseases are now extending into children as well. This is very old data. I'm sure Dr. Barkin will talk about this in more detail. But uh, old data from uh, the Arkansas Children's Hospital showing the increased number of cases showing up of type 2 diabetes, what used to be called adult onset diabetes in children. So obesity is increasing in incidence. It, it, it increases the incidence of a number of serious diseases. and. Uh, so let's talk about what treatments are out there for obesity. First of all, um, if you look at a meta-analysis of low-fat diets, you can see that dieting really is not very effective. On average, the weight loss that can be achieved with a low-fat diet is around two or three kilograms, five pounds roughly. Another study five years later, same conclusion, a uh, having trouble advancing the slides here. There we go. Two to four kilogram average weight loss with low-fat diets. There's nothing unique about low-fat diets. The same thing is true for every other diet out there. So there is no magic diet. Um, the Atkins diet, zone diet, etc. On average, a couple kilogram weight loss on those diets. Well, what about exercise? Um, again, a meta-analysis of exercise shows that if you look at 16 weeks, studies under 16 weeks or studies over 26 weeks, again, average weight loss in this study showed 2.4 kilograms. Well, what about pharmaceutical approaches that physicians have available? There's currently three drugs on the market primarily for treatment of obesity, fentermine, subutramine, and Orlistat. The, the last one's over the counter. There's a new drug that's been approved in Europe, Ramonabant, that blocks the cannabinoid receptor, the receptor that the active ingredient of marijuana acts at to cause uh, increased food intake. And Ramonabant, mo most of these drugs can produce, again, a five to about a five kilogram weight loss on average in most studies. Ramonabant may be a little bit better in this study. Uh, you see about an eight kilogram weight loss, but keep in mind that after 36 weeks on the drug, the weight loss is plateauing. This drug may never get approved in the U.S. There are significant side effects. So pharmaceutical treatment is not very effective. There is, however, one treatment out there which is very effective, and that is gastric bypass surgery or gastric banding. The remarkable thing about these two procedures is that they reduce profound weight loss, up to 30, 40 percent change in body weight, and that weight loss is sustained over many, many years, up to 10 years of follow-up. So in contrast to dieting and exercise or drug treatment, where, where continued intervention is necessary to maintain two to eight kilograms of weight loss, gastric bypass surgery seems to produce a sustained significant weight loss. And I'll just show you one example of an individual, a 385-pound a woman who lost over 200 pounds and sustained that weight loss over many years. After two or three years started to creep up, the physician put her on fentermine, but with uh, that combined treatment was able to sustain a 200 pound weight loss. Um, but the problem with gastric bypass surgery is it's only approved for severe obesity, morbid obesity, and it's invasive and it's expensive. So, so the bottom line is that the current treatments are really not optimal. The pharmaceutical treatments don't work. Dieting and exercise has a marginal impact uh, on existing obesity. 
Not to say that, that that small impact isn't important. There are lots of studies out there that show a significant decrease in disease risk with even modest weight loss, but increased activity and better nutrition. So I don't want to indicate that, that, uh, that those modalities aren't worth um, uh, using. They are, but the point is that there are major issues with all of the treatments out there for obesity today. Quite interestingly, it's been known for some time how hard it is to lose weight and keep it off. And this is very typically what is seen. This, is, this shows uh, long-term weight change using a low-calorie diet. And when people, go after the, when people go off of the diet within one to three years, they go back up to their old weight. Uh, the same thing happens with drug treatment, as I mentioned. This is treatment with fentermine. Um, the patient stopped treatment where the arrow is indicated, and within a year and a half, the patient is back up to his or her old weight. Interestingly, when you gain weight very rapidly, the same thing happens, and there's at least two studies that show this, a Vermont prisoner study done many, many years ago, uh, and uh, this interesting study done in Cameroon, where individuals, young individuals, young men who participate in a fattening ritual uh, gain up to 15 kilograms rapidly within a few months. That's, that's about 30 pounds in a few months. And then when they go back to their normal lifestyle after the ritual, they go back to their old weight after three years also. So if you lose weight quickly or you gain it quickly, you put it back on. And so what we now know from, from, from these observations as well as many, many other studies is that it doesn't matter what body weight you are. Your brain is working very hard to homeostatically control your weight. So it doesn't matter whether you're a lean supermodel or an obese sumo wrestler. Um, the brain regulates your body weight. And if I could go back a slide. There we go. And this is, this is demonstrated here. Oh, my pointers seem to be working here. But anyway, if you look at the graph on the right, that just shows an obese mouse and a lean mouse. And when you food restrict the obese mouse and then give it free access to food at, at day four, it goes right back up to its old weight. Same thing is true on the bottom with the lean mouse. You food restrict it, it loses weight. It goes back up to its old weight. I showed you that data for humans. This is data in an experimental animal system. What that means is that the brain must know what you used to weigh. And this has led to the weight set point hypothesis, that every individual has a genetically inherited set point or set curve that governs your body weight. And that, of course, environmental in factors clearly influence this set point. That's what's happened in the obesity epidemic. And you'll hear more about that from our next speaker. Uh, and that, therefore, the brain must have a device, must have a circuit that senses your adipose mass and alters a number of things, such as your hunger drive, your intake, your expenditure, in order to maintain homeostasis, just like the thermostat in your room senses the energy, the heat, in your room and turns on or off the furnace to maintain a constant heat. Indeed, if you look at people's body weights, what you can see is how incredibly stable they really are over time. And therefore, what this says is that uh, when you gain weight quickly or you lose weight, there must be forces that bring you back up to your previous weight. And I'll show you some examples of that. So this is an experiment that Rudy Leibel did at the Rockefeller. I believe he was at the Rockefeller at this time, where he calculated how much energy individuals, um, how much energy individuals needed in order to maintain their body weight. And, and scientists can do that uh, based on your body weight and, and how much lean mass you have, figure out how much energy it would take to keep you at a constant weight. And then they took individuals and uh, they had them either gain weight or lose weight. And what they showed was that when you gain weight quickly, your, ex your, your energy, your energy um, expenditure is greater than expected. When you lose weight, the opposite happens. You, you burn less energy than before, and that helps bring, bring you back to homeostasis. Well, if, you, if the brain is so great at this, if the brain is so great at keeping you at the same body weight, how is it that the obesity epidemic is, is happening? Well, it has to do with the fact that this device 
does not recognize the slow slippage that occurs over years. And I'll show you the exact molecular mechanism by which that works in a minute. But typically, people gain weight slowly. So in a typical example, a 20-year-old male uh, is, becomes 50, and next thing they know, they're 30 pounds overweight. That's only a pound per year on average of weight gain. That's only 10 kcals a day that you're storing more than you're burning in the form of fat. And that's the equivalent of one potato chip a day. What that means is that even when you become obese, your brain is, is still doing an incredibly good job of keeping your weight constant. So how have we learned, how have scientists learned about the molecular mechanisms that really prove that this happens? Well, just as people uh, breed dogs and horses, um, for, for a century or longer, people have bred mice for, for a hobby, and, and gradually scientists began using those mice for research, but during the normal process of maintaining mouse strains, mouse fanciers, as they're known, as well as scientists, identified five mouse strains that had spontaneous genetically transmitted obesity syndromes, and they gave them funny names, agouti, obesity, diabetes, fatty, and tubby. And this is an example of an OB mouse shown here compared to a normal mouse that does not have the obesity or OB gene. Well, Jeff, Rockefeller, uh, Jeff Friedman at the Rockefeller worked hard to clone the gene to identify the single gene that caused that OB or obesity phenotype mouse, and he discovered that that gene encoded a hormone. That hormone is made almost exclusively by fat. Um, it acts in the brain. And in the next slide, well, I'm missing one slide's not coming up here. In any event, I had a slide that showed that that hormone in your blood is made in, in proportion to the amount of fat mass that you have. Well, the le mutations in the leptin gene also occur in humans. This shows um, a child that is a homozygous recessive, that is, lacks both copies of the leptin gene, is lacking this hormone. And what happens after that child is treated with leptin? Leptin is a magic bullet treatment for obesity, but only for, for people who have a deficiency of the hormone. And it turns out that deficiency is exceedingly rare. So it is not going to be the magic bullet for obesity, except for a rare number of kids. But this is an example of how science can can not only produce uh, knowledge, but also uh, basic research in mice go on to produce treatments in, in kids. That, that changes kids' lives. Well, my group worked on the mouse called the agouti mouse, and we ultimately discovered what caused obesity in that mouse strain. And it, it turned out to lead to the discovery of the circuit in the CNS that is the critical circuit in the nervous system, or one of the critical circuits that leptin acts on. This is just a detailed picture of the circuit showing that we've now learned a lot about it and we know that not only does leptin act on this circuit in the, in the brain, but the gut acts as well. Leptin controls long-term energy stores, that is the energy that you store in fat uh, to get you through a famine and etc. Um, but also your brain is making decisions on a meal-to-meal -meal basis. How much food are you going to eat at lunch? When are you going to feel full? Well, it turns out that decisions about your long-term energy stores and decisions about meal-to-meal um, -meal hunger and satiety are made in these same regions, communicated to what the circuit that we call the central melanocortin system. And we now, and scientists have now identified mutations in in people that cause obesity when different elements of this circuit are disrupted as well. So again, what we've learned in the mouse, um, if we could cycle through this slide and get all the pictures up here on this slide. There we go. So for example, leptin acts, um, acts on this circuit at the base of the brain and the vagal nerves and gut hormones act on these circuits. The child in the bottom left panel had a mutation in the leptin receptor in the brain and severe obesity. The child on the bottom right uh, had a mutation in a critical gene in the melanocortin circuit called the POMC gene that makes a neuropeptide that drives that circuit. And the children up above 
um, have mutations in a receptor for that neuropeptide called the melanocortin-4 receptor. We now know that 5% of kids with severe obesity uh, have a mutation in this receptor. So it's a major cause of severe obesity in children. So basically everything we're learning in the mouse applies to human obesity. But again, these are all very rare or moderately rare syndromes causing severe disease. And let me, let me emphasize, they're not responsible for common obesity. So I think what you can, I think the conclusion from the science here is obvious. Um, the brain works very hard and is very good at maintaining your weight, making it extremely difficult to lose significant amounts of weight. Again, I emphasize even modest weight loss, however, is, has a very, very uh, clear health advantage. Um, but, but it is extremely difficult to lose weight once you put it on because of the reason that I showed you. The brain has a device that works very hard to keep your body weight constant. Furthermore, there are no really effective and safe and inexpensive treatments for obesity. So prevention is key, and for years now, I've been a strong advocate of the creation of comprehensive obesity research centers at medical centers like Vanderbilt. We created such a center at Portland where we could bring physicians and scientists and policymakers together to not only get the best and latest scientific and medical advice out to policymakers, but also get scientists actively involved in communicating knowledge about this situation to the public. So our center in Oregon was involved in creation of media. We were involved in public health outreach. Um, our administrative director, Joan Randall, who we also succeeded in recruiting here to Vanderbilt, uh, within two years had every uh, physician and scientist in the obesity center serving on task forces in the community for the legislature, for local schools, to help guide policy creation and provide the best medical advice. Uh, so this is some of the uh, public health outreach we were involved in. We were involved with the Science Museum to create and host exhibits. And lastly, uh, the physicians and scientists in the center were very active in public health advocacy. And uh, so thank you for coming here today, and thank you for the important work you do in this area. Good morning, everybody. So um, I think we all know now that we have to put down those potato chips. Bad. Just even one a day. Um, I'm delighted that you're all here today to be part of this discussion. This first part of the morning is very much about what is the current state of the problem, and then we, we quickly move into the next part, which is what is it that we can do about it? I think that everybody in this audience already knows that it's a problem, it's a big problem, and you're anxious to figure out what it is that we can do today and tomorrow working together to impact the problem. I'm Dr. Sherry Barkin. I'm the Division Chief of General Pediatrics in the Department of Pediatrics working at the Children's Hospital. And we are delighted that we get to host this innovative, unique kind of forum with collaboration with the FCC. Chairman Martin, all the commissioners that are here, Commissioner Adelstein, McDowell, Cops and of course Commissioner Tate who is a lightning rod for action and you'll be hearing a lot more about what the FCC has done specifically to address this problem. What I'd like to do this morning is I want to try to take you through what I call, what is going on here? Epidemiology and root causes. Why are things so different now than just when I was a child? Feels like things have changed rather quickly. Is that true? Is that perception or reality? So in this next section, I hope that you get two things out of it. The first is to understand the scope of the problem of pediatric obesity. The second is to identify contributing factors to the epidemic of pediatric obesity. The CDC is a real leader in this area of obesity, and they've put together a lot of excellent resources that you can find on the internet. I'm going to take you through a series of slides that the CDC has put together so that you can see with your own eyes, is this real or is this just our perception? It looks at adult obesity over the past 20 years. And I just want to orient you. You can decide which state it is that you would like to look at as I quickly move through the slides. Light blue is good. That means that fewer than 10% of the adult population is obese. 
we determine obesity by something called body mass index. That is your weight in relationship to your height. And for adults, it's very concrete. We're able to say if your BMI, your body mass index, is greater than 30, you are obese and at risk for type 2 diabetes, hypertension, stroke, coronary artery disease, and early death. So first I want to take you through what's happening with adult obesity, and then we'll talk about what's happening with childhood obesity. Blue is good. Dark blue means that now you're approaching um, closer to 20%. As soon as you get to yellow, greater than 20% of adults are obese. Orange means that greater than 25% are obese, and for a few select states, you'll see over time the orange stippled color. That means that greater than 30% of the adult population is obese. So I'd like you to notice this begins in 1985, and you can see that we didn't have a lot of data because we weren't tracking it initially, but we did have data for some of these states here. So I, of course, am looking at this region right here, and also the southeast region as I look. So pick your state as we go through these slides and notice what happens. Now, what happens right about 10 years ago is you start to see some of that yellow color. Yellow is bad, greater than 20% now of the adult population is obese. And I want you to notice something that we have puzzled about. Tennessee's not yet in this, this area, but it seems like it's really a southeast issue and Alaska. We'll come back to that. Now take a look here. That's just 1999. Do you see how quickly it spread there? And across the country and now we see orange for the first time. And just about four years ago, just four years ago, you can see that greater than 25 percent of the adult population now is obese in the southeast region, and it quickly spreads. The way that a virus spreads, it looks like it's almost contagious. Unfortunately, Tennessee now has the distinction of being tied with other southeast states for having the highest percentage of adults that are obese in our state. We are the fourth highest in childhood obesity. Those slides were able to track adults. We are now tracking children. We weren't, but we are now. And we know that the childhood obesity epidemic is mirroring the adult obesity epidemic. And we're going to talk a little bit about the whys. So first, obesity. Now, I said that it was defined with this body mass index, that we're able to use a very concrete number. You are at risk for overweight if you're an adult if your BMI is greater than 27. You are obese if your BMI is greater than 30. Things are a little different for children, and that's because children are growing. That means you have to look at BMI, where you fit in terms of what's expected in a growing child, and gender also makes a difference. And I'll show you a slide about that in just a moment. The definition of obesity is an excessively high amount of body fat or adipose tissue in relationship to lean body mass. Because children grow at different ages, and for different genders. The CDC has this BMI growth chart that I'll show you in a moment, whereas overweight is now defined as greater than or equal to the 85th percentile for age, gender, and obese is defined as greater than or equal to the 95th percentile. What am I talking about? We use these growth curves. If you have children, you've seen them before. We use these growth curves to say, how is your child growing in terms of their weight when you come in for your annual checkup? How are they doing in terms of their height and their head circumference? This chart that was developed by the CDC now looks at that body mass index, so your weight in relationship to your height. And it looks at what's normal. So what is normal versus what is not normal? Usually, it used to be that if you fell anywhere in a curve, if this was a weight curve, and you weren't outside the lines, you were normal. But we know in regards to your association with getting diseases and sequelae of obesity, that it is this area. If you are greater than the 85th percentile, that 85th to the 95th, you're overweight, 
and you have a slight association with an increased chance of getting diabetes, type 2 diabetes when you're a child, hypertension, uh, dyslipidemia, or hypercholesterolemia. If you are greater than that 95th percentile here, just mirrored with what Dr. Cohen says, you have a much greater chance of having those adverse consequences. So what is the connection between childhood and adult obesity? We know that rapid infant weight gain predicts childhood overweight at age four. I know we love our chubby babies. I know they're cherubic and they look quite healthy. If they grow too quickly in infancy, it is associated with overweight when they're preschoolers. We also know that overweight toddlers are five times as likely to be overweight adolescents, and that overweight adolescents have a 70% risk, and you saw with Dr. Cohen's slide, up to an 80% risk of becoming overweight or obese adults. We also know that 60% of overweight children, not obese, overweight children, by the time they are five to 10, they already have one or more risk factors for heart disease or diabetes. Here in the Department of Pediatrics and at the Monroe Carroll Junior Children's Hospital, we have a weight management clinic that is directed by Dr. Greg Plemons, who's here today. And we are screening for all of these problems when children come in as young as two and three who are clearly obese. But we also know that different children behave differently, and the numbers of who is impacted is disproportionate. So of four to five-year-olds, also CDC data, white children are 4.5% of four to five-year-olds, 4.5% are overweight who are white children. 12 to 15%, if you are African-American, are overweight at four to five. And a quarter of children who are Latino, age four to five, are overweight. It affects things it affects different ethnicities and different people differently. And that is what we're going to focus on next. You heard from Dr. Gitlin, and you will hear from Commissioner Tate and many of us over and over again. This is not just an epidemic that we can brush off and say, oh, this is a curiosity. We have to examine it and do something about it now, because for the first time, our current generation, if you were born in the year 2000, one in three of those children will get diabetes, and many of them could become the first in American history to live shorter lives than their parents. I mentioned this link between childhood overweight and adult disease because if you are overweight and obese as a child, already you have risk factors. Already you can get diabetes. Already you can have hypercholesterolemia and atherosclerosis in your uh, blood vessels. Already you're at risk for stroke and already premature death. After a short stay in America, Michelangelo's David statue has been brought back to Europe. So what is going on here? What is it? This problem of obesity is not strictly an American problem. It is global, but we lead the pack in many ways, and why? So I'd like to take you through a series of layers trying to examine the root causes. Let's start with what we all hold to be true in our minds. If you don't eat well and you don't move your body, you're probably going to be obese. And you just heard about energy homeostasis. This is what we call the, the seesaw here. This is when you're, you're eating too much, you're weighing down that seesaw, you're not moving your body enough, and so you're gonna store those calories. Is that true? How are we doing in terms of our nutrition? Well, we know that soft drink consumption has more than doubled. This is data from the Longitudinal Study of Child Development in Quebec, and it shows that children who regularly consumed sugar-sweetened beverages from age two to four, they were more than twice as likely to be overweight by the time they were four to five years old. I can't tell you how many times we see children coming into our clinic that have a sippy cup filled with soda. There's not milk in there, there's soda in there. 
We also know that only 3%, yes, that's all of us, I include myself here too, of the U.S. population, meet the requirements for grains, fruits, vegetables, meats, and dairy. We're not doing so well in terms of what we're choosing to put in our mouth. We also know that we have a different expectation now. When we're thirsty, six to eight ounces just won't do. We need to have a 20 to 32 ounce bottle. We like to hold those great big bottles that I call this the big gulp expectation. You're not really gonna quench that thirst unless you have more. We know that just the typical can of soda has 10 teaspoons of sugar in it. So now multiply that, can of soda 12 to 16 ounces, Increase that to your big gulp expectation. And some of the advice that we give, Dr. Plemons and I, and the physicians in the Division of General Pediatrics working in the weight management clinic give is, let's just go to sugar-free beverages. We know that if you just cut out your sugary beverages, for the average American child, you'll probably lose 10 pounds. A supersized meal, and there are fewer of those now, I'm happy to report, is equal to one full day's worth of calories. And just a reality check, uh, a, a large, an extra large soda, regular soda, and a hamburger have the same amount of calories. How about activity? How are we doing in terms of activity? Well, you're going to hear today from Alan Simpson at Common Sense Media. On average, an American child is exposed to 45 hours of media a week. 45 hours, that is a full-time job. There are fewer physical demands that are built into daily life. We come from an agrarian society. We had to work to reap our food, to make sure that we could get enough to eat. Now we have to walk just a few steps. Fewer physical demands built into daily life. And just another interesting piece of data, in the 1960s, mid-1960s, 41% of children were walking to school. Now, fewer than 15% of children walk to school. F fewer physical demands built into daily life. And as age increases, we all well know here that activity decreases. This is from a recent study that just was published. Um, this revealed that Hispanic immigrant children are twice as likely to be inactive as native-born children. 22.5% of immigrant Hispanic children were physically inactive versus 9.5% of U.S.-born white children. This is from the, and the National Survey of Children and looked at thousands of children. We know, however, that native-born children are almost twice as likely to use media excessively. So maybe it all actually evens out here in regards to inactivity. And I'm sorry to report that once, once an immigrant has acculturated, that discrepancy goes away. They are watching just as much media. Okay, so we cracked the code. We're not eating well, and we're not moving enough. So everybody, let's make those choices. Let's make better choices. Well, if that were true, then people who eat exactly what I eat should look exactly like me in terms of my body habitus. And that isn't true. Why isn't that true? You heard from Dr. Cohen this morning about your genetics. And we know now that we've cracked another code. That's the genome code. And we're now able to look with genome-wide association studies and case control studies to look at genes that are associated with obesity. These are just some examples. Many are associated with obesity. So we know that what you're eating is interacting with your genetic code, and that determines your phenotype or how you look. And an example of this here is just this last one here, the SREBF1. I wanted to just highlight this one because this gene is associated with all the physiologic mechanisms of energy homeostasis. This is one of many genes. That means depending on how this gene looks in you, you will be able to regulate your blood sugar and also your adipose, your uh, lipogenesis, which is the generation of fat, and lipolysis, which is the breakdown of fat. So now you're thinking, oh, it's my genes. I can't really do anything about it. And you're kind of relieved. But the reality is that the causes of most preventable mortality, and this includes obesity and diabetes and hypertension, 
and many other causes of preventable mortality, when we stack up what contributes to what actually manifests in our body, whether we will actually get type 2 diabetes, you can see that a sizable proportion is linked with our genetic makeup, about 30%, and in some studies, 40%. But you can see that the great majority determining and contributing to that mortality is behavior. There are other things as well, such as environmental toxins, uh, social conditions, and access to health care. But I would like you to really consider that the answers aren't as simple as whether you put down that bag of potato chips, which please do, and whether you have that gene functioning for leptin. By the way, I know m many of us are hoping that we have that leptin gene. It's very rare. It doesn't explain common obesity, as Dr. Cohen mentioned. It is not just what we eat, and it is not just our genes. We are built as an adaptive species. Very little of what comes out when we're born is hardwired. That's on purpose. We're built that way so that we can respond to our environment. And how we respond to our environment then hardwires how our bodies will respond to certain situations. Now, this is very important because, and a big reason why I'm a pediatrician, many of these critical windows of development happen in the developing fetus, in the neonate, in infancy, in early childhood also in adolescence and young adulthood, but just many fewer critical windows happen later. Most of the critical windows for developing how we will be hardwired to respond to our environment, whether we're going to turn that gene on that many of us might have for diabetes, will depend on what we're exposed to in our environment and how we respond to that with our behavior. This is a very dynamic interaction. This is just another schematic to consider this, and that is that we have environmental sensory inputs. It impacts our brain. Our brain, which is the conductor of our body, will then signal to alter physiology and metabolism. This will communicate with other communication control centers in our body. We now know that fat, for example, is an endocrine organ. There are hormones that are generated in the fat that then communicate back to the brain. There are hormones in our pancreas, of course. We're more familiar with that. And we have discovered a slew of new hormones that live in our GI tract. The GI tract is possibly the largest endocrine organ that we have. So it's a dynamic interaction. Sounds interesting, maybe a bit too scientific. Let me give you an example. So this is an example. I'm going to break down that triangle and look at certain of these interactions. This is an example about how behavior and physiology are talking to each other and intricately linked. There are epidemiologic studies that have demonstrated an association between sleep deprivation and increased body mass index at younger ages. This association weakens with advancing age. That goes back to the critical windows of development notion. What's the mechanism of action? In this particular study, uh, it appeared that you, decreased sleep led to decreased leptin, which you heard about from Dr. Cohen led to increased ghrelin, which is sort of the evil twin of leptin, which then increased appetite. So I want to tell you this again. If you're not sleeping, and by the way, we all should be sleeping seven to eight hours a night. I'd like to sleep longer than eight hours, honestly. If we're able to sleep that amount, the hormones that we release will actually be those of satiety. If we wake up early, we're going to feel hungrier. If we have trouble sleeping, we are going to feel hungrier. So just a little bit more then about that physiology. It's intricate, it's dynamic, and it's constantly communicating within our body. So this breaks down a little bit further that sleep deprivation changes a lot of things. We talked about how it decreases the leptin, which would um, leptin improving your satiety so you're not as hungry. It increases the ghrelin, which makes you feel like you actually are hungrier. You have increased time to eat. 
And you're not running a few laps. You have lower energy expenditure. Our body's actually made to slow down at night. All of these things together then lead to increased insulin resistance. And scientists are really looking hard at increased insulin resistance. It's associated with inflammation. It's associated with poor response for your, uh, your uh, immunogenicity, how you are able to fight off infections. And it is certainly associated with diabetes. This leads to decrease, decreased glucose tolerance. And this then leads to diabetes. There are other pathways through obesity into diabetes. So this is quite intricate and dynamic. I'd like to look at another part of that triangle now and look at that interaction between environment and behavior. So I have two examples here. One is poverty. Poverty is a very strong risk factor for childhood obesity. And in fact, you might not realize this, but we know that obesity is one of the most visible forms of malnutrition around. We're used to thinking of people that are quite thin and emaciated. Obesity is malnutrition. So a little bit here about poverty. How does that affect obesity? In a study of Baltimore's homeless shelters, 18% of children were overweight and 23% were obese. Those are the new CDC definitions. Based on data from the NHANE study, which looks a national epidemiologic study that's done regularly to see how are we eating, how are we moving our bodies, um, we know that children from food insecure households are more likely to have BMI for age in the 85th to 95th percentile than children from food secure households. What is this about food insecurity? Food insecurity means you don't know where your next meal is coming from. And in fact, if we go back evolutionarily, that was much of what our ancestors faced. We didn't know. As a result, if you don't know where your next meal is coming from, you might hoard or store. And then you might actually have more fat buildup so that in times of deprivation where you can't find additional nutrition or food, you'll be able to use your fat stores much the way that other animals work in the winter time. This is the thrifty gene hypothesis. And what we know now is that although we were set up that way as an adaptive species to respond to our environment and whether we had uh, deprivation, which was more common, we really weren't set up to be in an environment of, an, of abundance where we could easily go to the drive through window, where we could walk quite quickly to our pantry, to our refrigerator, and have easy access to food. So a word about access to food. Very important data that has come out just in this past year showing that the availability of supermarkets, that is associated with lower BMI. This has to do with access to food, whereas the availability of convenience stores are associated with a higher BMI. Your environment will impact this problem. And now I want to layer just one more um, element to consider. We have talked about our behavior. We've talked about nutrition and activity. We've talked about our genetic makeup. We've talked about how this is a dynamic and interactive system. We are influenced not only by what we do, but by what is done by those around us and what we are exposed to. This is the ecologic model, and this is what my research team uh, grounds all of our research studies in. The ecologic model is also used widely by the World Health Organization to combat big problems like malaria. It posits that a child lives in the context of their family and will be very much influenced, that child, by what that family does. This family, in turn, lives in the context of the community and will be impacted by whether there are supermarkets there or convenience stores there or community centers there or pathways to walk to school safely. And that this community lives in society. And it's typically society that sets normative expectations. And in many ways, as we've talked about, since the average American child, and I haven't said anything about the average American adult, but it's fairly close, is engaged in media about 45 hours a week for the average American child. 
Most of the messages that we get from society come from media. And this is a big reason why we are so grateful to the FCC for leading the effort and looking at what is it that the media can do in regards to impacting this problem. So I'd like to give you a really compelling example of this. This is from a study from the New England Journal of Medicine that came out last year from Christakis and Fowler. And this looked at the Framingham Heart Study, one of the lo longest, largest longitudinal studies around that was actually set up to look at heart disease in adults. But now we had data over 30 years for more than 20,000 people. They looked at a subset of that 20,000, 2,200, and they wanted to ask the question, how do we impact each other with social networks in terms of our behavior? So just to orient you a little bit to this slide, each of these nodes represents one of those 2,200 people. A green node means that you have a normal body mass index. A yellow node means that your body mass index is greater than 30. This was just done with adults. Then you look also at the connections between these nodes. If it's purple, that means they are a friend or there is a familial tie. And if it's orange, that means there's a, f um, I I'm sorry, if it's purple, it is marital or familial. And if it's orange, it's friendship, a friendship tie. I want you to just Imagine you're in an art gallery and notice the patterns in this slide. You see how typically these nodes, the yellow nodes, tend to cluster here. So what is the impact that we have on each other in regards to this issue of obesity? Well, they looked at that specifically in this study and found that we are impacted by those people we spend time with. In fact, we know that a person's chance of becoming obese is greater than 37% if your spouse is obese. It's greater than 40% if your sibling is obese. And here's the one that is most important, and I'm delighted we have the Montessori Academy here to listen to this, that it is greater than the 57% if our friends are obese. We are greatly impacted by the behaviors of our friends. And obesity is just one of those examples. This is an understanding of social networks and how we impact each other. And how that creates the social norms in the ecologic model. Well, I'm very excited that today you will be hearing from Dr. Doug Camero who was able to serve with the Institute of Medicine's Task Force in Pediatric Obesity. And he's going to be talking about that action, blueprint action, so that we can address this issue in a very uh, interactive, dynamic way. And I wanted to point out that this is from the Institute of Medicine's report. Remember, we're looking here about how do we impact this problem of obesity in childhood, which would impact the problem of obesity in adulthood. We have to look at that energy balance, what you're eating versus how much you're moving. That's going to be impacted by what you're here, what you're exposed to, such as access to supermarkets and convenience stores. This will be impacted by things like uh, whether you're active in school. And I'm happy to report that our state passed legislation over the past year in 2006, 2007 to mandate physical activity as part of the school environment. Likewise, you have to consider the genetic and psychosocial factors, but as we said, that is one contributing factor. It is not the major one. It's behavior that's the major one, and we have to consider how, what influences behavior. So you can see this is actually very much the ecologic model that is considered for the Institute of Medicine recommendations that you will be hearing much more about. So I hope that what you have learned from this half hour is that when we talk about the root causes of pediatric obesity, that it is not as simple as that potato chip or whether we went out for our morning jog, that it is a dynamic interaction between environment, behavior, and genetics. 
and that this dynamic interaction is impacted greatly by ecologic levels. The child in the context of their family, their family in the context of their community, and their community in the context of society. So we move now to the part of our morning session which is focused a little bit more on that. We're going to talk a little bit more about the impact of media more in depth. And I'm delighted that I get to introduce Mr. Alan Simpson. He previously served as the Senior Director for Marketing and Communications at the National Association for the Education of Young Children. He currently is the Director of Policy for Common Sense Media, a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving media in the lives of children and families. And he will be talking with us today about the impact of media on obesity. Welcome, Alan. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barkin, and thanks to everyone here at Vanderbilt for hosting the event, and obviously thanks also to everyone from the Federal Communications Commission for all the work they've been doing on this issue, for, to Chairman Martin and Commissioner Tate and all the other commissioners. The graph here gives you a little more illustration about why common sense media exists. As Dr. Barkin said, we're an advocacy organization concerned with all issues for kids in media, and as she mentioned, kids today use media nearly 45 hours per week compared to about 17 hours per week that they spend with their parents and about 30 or 32 hours per week in school. We don't know uh, conclusively that all of that media has a negative impact. Certainly some of it has a positive impact, but it's the reason why we focus on media and all of the impacts that it has on kids today. However, up until now, there's been very little comprehensive analysis of all the different studies tracking the impact of media on children's health. And most of the comprehensive analysis that there has been has focused on media and violence. So recently, Common Sense Media asked researchers from Yale University of Medicine, the National Institutes of Health, and the California Pacific Medical Center to conduct a meta-analysis of all the best recent research from 1980 to the present. They've reviewed about 130 quantitative studies. Their research is still going on. And their studies have examined the relationship between media exposure and seven health, health outcomes for children and adolescents. Childhood obesity, tobacco use, drug use, alcohol use, low academic achievement, sexual behavior, and attention deficit disorder. They searched for studies on all types of media, including television, music, the internet, video games, uh, magazines, everything we, can, we know that kids are using. However, most of the recent research has all the high-quality studies they've found have really focused on television and movies and music. So one of the reasons that their study is ongoing, their analysis is ongoing, is to look at some of the studies over the last few years that will look more at new media, which is growing so dramatically in kids' lives, the internet and video games and mobile phones. That's an important area for future research, but they are looking at the pieces they can add right now so that we can better understand their impact, both positive and negative. The results of what they've found so far will not surprise you, but they should motivate all of us to continue working together to fight the childhood obesity epidemic. Overall, in these 130 plus studies, greater media exposure was associated with negative health outcomes for children in more than 80% of the studies. Most of the other studies found no definitive association and very few found a positive impact. In particular, 27 of the studies evaluated exposure to media content, such as movies or TV scenes involving smoking or particular genres of music. 93% of those studies found that exposure to specific media content is associated with negative health outcomes. No study found an association between specific media content and positive health outcomes. 103 of the studies evaluated media quantity, the amount of time kids spend with media, playing or listening or creating with media. 76% of those studies reported that more time spent with media was associated with a negative health outcome, while 21% found no statistic association, and 3%, or 2.9%, three of the 103 studies found an association between media quantity and positive health outcomes. More specifically, some of the we, a lot of the studies looked at childhood obesity. And overall, this meta-analysis, as I've just suggested, shows clear connections between media exposure and negative health outcomes. The clearest connection is in the case of childhood obesity. There were 62 high-quality studies that our researchers, researchers have reviewed so far that evaluated media and weight. All of them assessed media quantity rather than media content. 
88% found a significant relationship between media exposure and childhood obesity. 17 of those studies were longitudinal, following children over time, and 82% there concluded that more hours of media predicted increased weight over time. The more children watched or used media, the more likely they were to be overweight or obese. One notable example, the Riley Armstrong et al. study, uh, conducted in the United Kingdom and published in 2005, looked at more than 8,200 children and found that kids who spent more than eight hours watching TV per week at age three were significantly more likely to be obese at age seven. The rate of children, for children who watched less than four hours per week, the prevalence was about 5.2% of childhood obesity. If they watched between four and eight hours per week, the prevalence of childhood obesity at age seven was 8.3%. And if for children who watched more than eight hours per week, the prevalence was 10.3% at age seven, for almost double the amount watching four hours or less per week. We know, and this forum reminds us and gives an opportunity to remind us, that many factors contribute to childhood obesity. And through these studies, we can confirm that media is one but a crucial factor. And there are several steps that we at Common Sense Media would recommend that parents and others take to reduce that negative impact. And those are, these connect in many ways to the Institute of Medicine's recommendations. It's important to emphasize that there's a role in this for everyone. We would suggest that parents can do more to limit the amount of time that kids spend with media. Monitor their use and help them appreciate why too much screen time is harmful. Get kids to play. Encourage them to spend more time outdoors or at school playing with other kids instead of watching and to play real games instead of virtual ones. But one of the other things that we'd also recognize is that there are now media, things like Dance Dance Revolution and We Fit, that are actually more healthy for kids and, more, and give them more opportunities to get up off the couch. Schools have a role as well. It's important, I think, that we restore physical education, more opportunities in sports and activities to make them part of kids' physical and social development. We can teach kids through schools to be smart media users. Schools can help parents and children learn simple ways to manage media in their lives and to balance the amount of media they use. We have a new Common Sense Schools project we're introducing this fall to really provide schools with parent media education tools so that educators can play more of a role in engaging parents about media use, which is growing in both home and school environments. Policymakers obviously have a role. I've mentioned the limited amounts of research on the newer media, and that's an important area for policymakers to support future research. It's also important to support more research on the content of media. As I said, most of the studies that our researchers have looked at are on the quantity, not the content, of media that kids consume. Policymakers obviously have a role also in developing more messages through public service announcements and campaigns to encourage healthy habits on the part of kids. Which brings me finally to one other point, the role of the media companies themselves that connects so much with that. One of the reasons, one of the founding principles for common sense media is the recognition that media is fun. We love media. Kids love media. Adults love media. Kids watch too much TV. Adults are too addicted to our Blackberries and our internet and everything else. The reason that we love this media so much is that it's really well made. It is the creativity of the people in the media world that has caused so many of us to fall in love with the stories and the music and the adventures that they create. They capture our imagination. And what we would say is it's now time for more of that cre creativity from the media world to be applied toward developing media and messages that encourage and support the healthy development of children. Thanks very much. I'd like to introduce now Dr. Doug Cameron. He is a professor of clinical family medicine at Georgetown. He's done much in his life. He's been an assistant surgeon general. He's led the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, and he now works as chief scientist at RTI International. He participated in the Institute of Medicine's Task Force on Childhood Obesity, and it is in that capacity that he will address us today, talking about what were these recommendations, what was this blueprint for action, and how are we doing so far. So welcome to Dr. Cameron. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Most importantly, I'm one of those 170-pound 20-year-olds who's now a 200-pound 50-something year old. <laughs> so uh, I want to talk to you about these three reports uh, and what was recommended. I was on two of them, uh, two of the committees. One thing about the IOM is they have really pretty-looking books, don't they? Uh, on the left uh, is one that was done uh, first. Uh, I was on that committee, and then the follow-up on the right. 
and then there's one on food marketing as well. You know that uh, childhood obesity is important because when you uh, turn to the New Yorker, they have cartoons on it. And that's how I, uh, I decide what's important. This is one of my favorite ones. So, you know, there's always, a, there's always a silver lining to everything. And the good news is witches are happy. Here are the three reports. Uh, the first one in 2005, second in 2006, and next in 2007. And you've already heard the setup for this. Uh, these uh, committees were convened uh, to respond to the epidemic of childhood obesity. Uh, and the stats have already uh, been communicated to you today. So here in the fine print are all the people on this uh, committee. Uh, and it was a, a diverse group, which was nice, because we had doctors, but we had public health folks and economists uh, and all kinds of other folks who were interested in this issue. The first report had three major conclusions after we spent a couple years from about 2003 to 2005, 2002 to 2004, uh, looking at all the evidence around uh, childhood obesity. Uh, the first is, it's a problem. The second is, uh, and that was the name of our report, Health in the Balance, uh, that the goal here is healthful eating and regular physical activity. Couldn't fix one without the other. Um, and finally, and this point has already been made too, but I'm going to talk about it a fair amount, is that this, it takes a village. You know, it's the whole deal. It's from the top to the bottom, from the family to the government, including school and every other part of the community that touches kids. Uh, it wasn't easy <laughs> to do what we've done, which is create a, a generation of fat children. No offense, kids. Um, but we've succeeded in doing it, and we've succeeded in doing it because a number of different things have aligned all at one time. So what we came up with, what we called an action plan, and, and you can see it laid out here, the, the different realms or sectors that we're talking about, uh, and let's just go through some of the recommendations. Uh, starting at home. Uh, we recommended on this committee a bunch of things that could happen at home that we thought would make a difference. Uh, the evidence wasn't conclusive, but it was persuasive uh, for all, all of these. Uh, breastfeeding is one thing that really makes a difference, providing healthful foods, encouraging healthful decisions, a regular physical activity. We said limit TV and other screen time. We like, I like the term screen time because that's about the only thing that's common to all of this is having a screen. Uh, to less than two hours a day. As you heard today, we're way over that at this point. Parents need to be role models, so they need to not just tell their kids what to do, but to do it. And finally, uh, consulting with doctors or healthcare providers uh, about kids and their weight status. In schools, a whole bunch can be done, and it's all about the time that's spent in school, the physical activity, the food choices that are available in school. And the world has changed dramatically for all the reasons that you heard about a little bit before today. You know, it used to be most, let me just try this. This is one that I often try. Uh, if you, kids can't respond. You guys have to not yet raise your hand. If you, as an adult, walked to school sometime when you were a kid, raise your hand. Okay. If your children, if you have children, walk to school, raise your hand. Okay. End of story. Uh, big difference. And those are really all the way through. We didn't have vending machines. We didn't have... Uh, we didn't have the school situation where you could pick a la carte foods. None of that existed. And these are the kinds of recommendations uh, we make for schools. Once you move up to the community, you have lots of different things. You have community regulations, but you have things that at, on first, at first blush you don't really think are important contributors to this. But things like city planning and zoning ordinances and whether you have sidewalks and whether you can walk to school safely, whether there's a way to get to school and there's not, you know, there's, that won't get you run over by cars or danger. All these things are related to how the community impacts on the obesity problem in kids. And then a healthy marketplace and media. We've heard about this already a bit. But part of it is because we spend so much time with media, we get a lot of our decisions and our kids get a lot of their preferences from that as well. So we can label our foods better, we can promote our foods better, we can make them better, more available, and advertising and marketing can be more responsible. I'll come back to that in a minute. And also, of course, media campaigns can play a big role in this. If they're done right, they can help change opinions and mold opinions. And finally, at the governmental level, there needs to be more leadership. And that was one of the recommendations that we made as well. Uh, not just the federal government level, but state and local. Uh, all these things can be happening. And finally, and also very importantly, there needs to be more research, and we need to keep up to date with what's going on, surveillance. 
The second com committee report, which I didn't serve on, uh, was about food marketing to youth and children. And they asked the question, is this a threat or an opportunity? The answer, of course, is both. Um, so I can say you can go to sleep for a few minutes. Uh, this was in response to the clear change in diets in American children. And uh, we have too much of the bad stuff, not enough of the good stuff. This is true for adults too, of course, but we're focusing on kids here. Too many calories, too many carbs, too many sweetened beverages, too much food away from home, and not enough of the things that are in those good food pyramids toward the bottom. So uh, we looked at uh, the group, sorry, the committee looked at uh, marketing statistics and saw that kids themselves both buy and influence the buying of a huge amount of products. This is not lost on the people who make uh, foods and other kinds of things. So they spend about $10 billion a year to market food, beverage, restaurant products to young consumers. And that's gone up tremendously. Look at this. This is kind of cool. This is new products targeted to the total market on the left, new products tar targeted to children and youth on the right. And you can see where the money's going to because kids make a difference. Uh, so there are all kinds of strategies and venues and vehicles, and lots of it's done in schools as well, uh, to get the message out. There are all kinds of techniques, and they're not just direct advertising. There are also endorsements, viral marketing, mobile marketing, product placement, all that stuff uh, takes place. So this committee, after looking at the, at the evidence, uh, at the data and, and trying to weigh the evidence, said that number one, Food and beverage marketing is very important. It's not the only thing. They're not the bad guys here entirely, but they're a big part of the issue here. Uh, and the ones that are char ch targeting children and youth are out of balance, uh, back to the balance uh, metaphor. Uh, and so they don't really help promote healthful diets. In fact, they go the other way. Uh, and they really haven't used their potential to make a difference in terms of promoting, he promoting healthy foods and beverages. Uh, it will require effort to do this, and we need to have some public policy that will help incentivize that. So they had a whole set of recommendations, which I won't go through, but if you want to find them, they're on the web. Uh, but the, I think the point I want to make with this slide is that these are in the same domains that the other recommendations are, no surprise. Uh, and, it, and it ranges from government policies, school policies, what happens at home, in the media, all that stuff uh, is related to marketing as well. The third report I want to talk about is the follow-up to the first one. Uh, the committee that I was on uh, issued our report in 2004, and in 2005, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation said, why don't you spend a year and come back and tell us in 2006 whether anything has happened uh, since you issued your report in 2004. So it was a smaller committee, some of the same people, and a few new people, and we ran around, went around the country, tried to learn about what was going on, and found out that the good news was a huge amount was going on. It's already a lot going on. In Tennessee, you're going to hear about uh, there's a lot going on here, too. But there were some concerns, and I want to tell you about them first. But I can't conclude my presentation without a terrifically complex figure. That's one of the requirements that they have when you buy PowerPoint. They say, if you're going to make a presentation, you have to have a figure that you can use your little uh, pointer and show. So this is ours. This one came from the second committee. A second IOM committee. But on the bottom, it's pretty easy to understand. There's energy in and energy out. So you eat some food, that's where the energy comes in, and you exercise or you don't exercise, and that's where the energy goes out. And there's supposed to be a balance. But the important point is that lots of things influence that. It's not just food and physical activity. It's all the circles and all these lines coming into the circles. Uh, we are, in fact, very interdependent. And that's true genetically. It's also true environmentally. So uh, the second committee uh, had four major conclusions. Number one, we didn't think enough was being spent uh, on this issue. Number two, we didn't think enough evidence and research was being get gathered about what can be uh, scaled up to a population-wide uh, programs or set of programs. Number three, everybody's got to do this. It's everybody's job, not just a few people. And number four, we've got to evaluate what we're doing uh, so we know the answers. And we recommended that uh, all of these groups need to lead and commit to childhood obesity prevention. Uh, and as I said, evaluate policies, monitor progress, and disseminate promising practices. So let's talk about some of these promising practices. Sectoral policies and promising activities start at the government. Uh, government can do things that governments do. You know, they make task forces. Uh, but they also supply money. 
uh, and programs. And so uh, these are some of the kinds of things that the government has done, part of the government that uh, usually deals with uh, food and nutrition and physical activity and health. Um, Department of Agriculture and Department of Defense have had these nice fruit and vegetable programs. Uh, the Center for Disease Control and Prevention had a great program, which unfortunately got killed in 2006, uh, called the VERB uh, campaign that has actually evaluated by some of my colleagues at RTI uh, and shown to make a difference in adolescents and pre-adolescents, actually, uh, and their physical activity, interest, and desires. Uh, CDC's also had a bunch of other nutrition programs. Uh, there's a Safe Routes to School program. So clearly some programs are getting underway uh, at the federal level. At the state level, uh, there are a lot of states, and including Tennessee, I don't want to insult Commissioner Cooper because I know she's going to tell you all about the things that, uh, that's going, that are going on here in, in, in Tennessee. But there are state action plans, uh, laws and regulations. Uh, there clearly is surveillance that's done by states. So there's a lot going on at the state level. And in fact, when we ran around, went around the country and had these little hearings, we learned a tremendous amount about the neat things that were going on uh, in the states. Communities also have an important role here, and they can be local champion. They can change their zoning. They can have open up their programs uh, to, in their schools, make sure that there are places for kids to play, uh, make sure that they're friendly to new uh, supermarkets and places where there haven't been supermarkets, encourage green grocers and others to come in and, and farmers markets uh, to come in so that there's more healthful food around and those kinds of things. Uh, these are some examples of policy changes that I just mentioned. They can also link up with academic uh, organizations such as the one we're at today. And schools, you know, kids spend more time in school than they spend with almost anything else except that we just learned with media. Uh, and so uh, schools are an enormously important place, and there are all kinds of strategies that are going on. And they range from the educational function to what actually happens in school, the food that goes on in school, after-school programs, using schools. All these things make a difference. And here are some examples of programs that have taken place in schools. But what's important especially about this is a lot of the programs are just going on, and they do them, and they say, great, we really need to make sure that the funding includes evaluation and that these results get published so that we know what works, we know what doesn't work, we know what makes a difference, and uh, what should be replicated around the country. Finally, we come to the home, and this is where really everything's very important, and yet it's one of the hardest places to reach, uh, because it's hard to know how you can, you know, cosmically as parents, we know that we're responsible. You know, the food doesn't come into a house, if the kids are little anyhow, by itself, we bring it in. Uh, and so we're clearly responsible. We set the, uh, the example for whether kids are going to get physical activity, uh, whether we throw them outside of the house or go outside of the house with them and make them move around. We also tolerate, permit, or don't permit uh, the kind of media that goes on. So it's easy to sort of blame it all on the parents, which is not the goal here. The question is, how can we help parents do a better job of this? And I think this is one of the central problems that we have. I was glad to hear that they're starting to create some media and some educational activities for parents because as a parent with three kids, I must say I don't think I have the answer to this, um, exactly how we're supposed to do it. But there have been some programs, uh, and some of them are here, uh, listed here. But we need a lot more, and again, a lot more evaluation. Finally, we get to corporations, uh, and they are in this in a big way. They make the food, some of the food that's been a problem for us. Uh, and which is so successfully marketed to all of us that we really want it. Uh, they create the stores and they locate those stores where they can make the most sales. That's sometimes not the place where they're needed the most. You know, a fifth supermarket in the fancy suburbs doesn't help the community as much as a first supermarket in an urban area that doesn't really have a supermarket. So there are all kinds of policy changes that are being made, some of which are being made, and some companies have really stepped up to this. I mean, I can speak from a personal example that we find for our kids, especially when they were younger, they're now older teenagers, that the 100 calorie pack types of uh, packaging, even though it's ecologically or environmentally not so great, it's really a nice change because you can control how much you put into somebody's lunch, uh, and the kids like them and they taste good. Gaming is starting to change. Uh, there are clearly some changes in characters and people who own the rights to these very popular characters, whether they're cartoon or other kinds of characters, and what they endorse and what they promote and what they help kids think is cool uh, can clearly make a difference. Finally, I wanted to mention uh, what's going on at the Institute of Medicine. You saw the, these three committee reports. They feel this is such an important um, 
issue that they've created a standing committee now so that they're going to have ongoing reports about childhood obesity and two that are coming up uh, is one on local government action and another one on uh, dec decision making for obesity prevention uh, trying to take action uh, based on evidence. Let me uh, conclude with this last quote uh, from one of the reports and that is preventing childhood obesity is a collective responsibility. The key is clearly to implement changes from many directions and at multiple levels. And unless we do that, we're not going to be successful in reversing this epidemic. Thanks. What we're going to do right now is we're going to take a break for 15 minutes. Please come back in 15 minutes when we will convene an FCC meeting and you will hear from many of our commissioners from the FCC as well as Mr. Gary Nell, CEO of Sesame Workshop, and Ms. Kelly Pena from Disney Channels Worldwide and Commissioner Cooper. See you in 15 minutes. slide. 